Hello, I'm now going to read you chapter seven of Le Grimoire, A Practical Guide to Red Magic. This chapter is called A Thimbleful of Hen's Blood. The white cockerel butcher shop was at the corner of Berthelot Road and Paul Cezanne Boulevard. Golden lettering decorated the high windows through which the boys could glimpse all sorts of luxury, luxury products. Jars of foie cans of homemade cooked cassoulet preserved in goose fat, small pots of caviar and expensive wine. Every day, unlucky chickens were roasted on a spit through the front window. It was possible to see the electric heating elements that ran down the whole length of the shop. Their tender meat turned into an appetizing meal above the grill. The delicious aroma of roast chicken <clears throat> wafted along the boulevard, wetting residents and pedestrians' appetites, if you were a meat eater, that is. The baker stopped, stopped kneading his dough and licked his moustache, thinking about his lunch. Further down the street, the florist put her hand on her stomach with a small wince. At the corner of Gambetta Street, the shoemaker spat on the leather boot he was making, drooling in anticipation. Theo and Bonaventure hesitated. The shop was impressive. Weren't they going to be sent away like unsavoury intruders? Engraved in high white letters on the front window, there were the words, free range and grain fed poultry. You see, said Theo, that's a good sign. It means the butcher goes to fetch his hens in the neighbouring farm and then he plucks them in his back room. Why is that important where they're plucked? You don't need feathers, you need blood, said Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, think about it. It's important because how am I going to recognise a black feathered hen if it's been plucked? I need to find hens that haven't yet lost their feathers, you get me? Good point, I hadn't thought of that. Theo nudged Bonaventure with his elbow. So are we going in? No, I'll wait for you here. I don't want to see a hen bleed, even a dead one. Whatever you want, said Theo. Theo went inside the shop. Timidly, he walked up to a man in a white shirt who was busy sticking labels and jars, jars of thrush pate. The butcher worked conscientiously, his tongue sticking out of the corner of his mouth, trying to make sure each label was straight. Theo moved forward and coughed so the man would know he was there. The butcher turned around towards him. What would you like, my boy? Uh, so, well, I mean, muttered Theo, this is going to sound weird, but I need a bit of blood from a black feathered hen. The butcher frowned and leaned towards the young man, twisting his neck so his ear was aimed towards Theo. What, he said, I didn't catch that, what do you want? I want black feathered hen's blood, I'll pay for it, of course. Hen's blood? What do you want to do with it? Make black pudding? Theo smiled. It's the school. We're going to study it with a microscope and compa compare it with white blood, with blood from a white feathered hen. Count the cells, search for signs of illness, like at the hospital, really. That's the one you don't hear every day, said the butcher. Do you need lots of it? A few drops, about a thimble full, said Theo. OK, follow me into the cold room. Let's see what we can do for you, said the butcher. The butcher led Theo to a small warehouse behind the main shop. The air conditioning blasted icy gusts above their heads. The butcher opened the door of the cold room, entering what, is, what was essentially a huge dark fridge. Theo thought about what his mother had told him about fridges, how he must never shut himself up inside them, even to play hide and seek. But this time the man was with him, and anyway, there was a handle on either side of the door. Theo bravely entered the cold room. The butcher groped around before finding the switch. Click, the neon light came on. A pale glow shone down from the ceiling and Theo took a step backwards in shock. In shock. There were big grey plastic vats filled with corpses. They were the dead bodies of freshly slaughtered hens. There were lots of them, all different colours. Red ones, white ones, black ones, two coloured ones even. 
The man caught a small black feathered hen by the legs and handed it to Theo. This is what you need, he said. This one's still warm. We should be able to get about half a glass of blood out of it. Theo paled and backed away, disgust written all over his face. Well, what is it, my boy? Didn't you ask for hen's blood? Yes, but I don't feel great inside this fridge. If it's all right with you, I might step out for a while. Can I wait for you outside? Of course. What do you want your blood in, a plastic box? If it's not too much trouble, please, that would be great. Theo left the cold room. As he waited for the macabre process to be over, he looked away and tried to think happy thoughts. About how much fun he'd had during his last winter holidays with his cousins, Romaine and Noemi. Skate skiing down the mountains, that was fun. And he enjoyed eating raclette afterwards, especially having worked up an appetite from a day outside. When the, potatoes weren't when the potatoes weren't floury but full of cheese, it was a treat. It was as good as chicken and chips, Theo decided. That was better. And he had to admit that ki killing a potato wasn't as sad as killing on clucking, a killing a clucking black feathered hen. Ah, but then there was the ham. And the ham had been a mischievous little pig with a damp snout, a panicked piglet suckling innocently as he was torn away from his mother. Whichever way you looked at it, you finished back inside that cold room. It was rather sad. After a long minute, the butcher turned off the light and exited the cold room. He handed Theo the bloodied box and walked him back to the walk for the shop. How much do I owe you, sir, said Theo, rummaging inside his pockets for change. Nothing, my boy, as it's for school. You're taking time off your weekend for school projects. All the more credit to you, if it had to cost you something as well. He was a nice man, this butcher, although he didn't care, although he didn't seem to care about the fate of his hens. That was food for thought. Theo didn't stay to ponder this paradox. He thanked the butcher, put the box in his rucksack and left the shop. He joined Bonifacio, who was waiting next to an advert for a swimming costume, leaning against a picture of the seashore. So you got it? It's in here, said Theo, proudly tapping his bag. Then he added, pointing at the advert, is going swimmingly. Ha, huh, snorted Bonaventure, nice one. The two friends parted way in front of the St. Clotilde gates. Theo combed his hair with his fingers and dusted his jeans. Tomorrow morning, I'll nip by your place around nine, he said. We'll cycle to Montspan to find the missing ingredients. Montspan, said Bonaventure, miles away. But well, why, why not? Now we've started, we might as well finish. What's missing? Sulphur, salt petra, and a horn of plenty, said Theo. And the ring, have you already got us one of those? Theo slapped his forehead with the flat of his hand. Oh, the ring, I'd completely forgotten about it. And I wanted to mention it to you this morning anyway, because I'm drawing a blank there. My mum cares about her jewellery, you see. She hasn't got much, and I get it. My mum's got chests full of the stuff. Most aren't worth much. Of course, they're just for fun. But there are a few in there that's made of gold. If I borrow a ring, she'll never notice. If I borrow a ring, she'll never notice. And my sister's always taking it out, necklaces and bracelets. What kind of ring is it again? It has to be white gold with an empty signet. Ah, oh, yes, I remember. A white gold ring with an empty space for a stone. I should be able to get my hands on that. That will be so brilliant, Bonav. We're going to get it, you know, our invisibility ring. They clapped their hands together, bumped each other's fists and finally shook hands. Theo headed home, skating slowly by the curb under the soft evening sun. The rubber wheels made a mute sound on the asphalt. Theo felt comfortable and relaxed despite the ache in his thighs and his lower back. He was tired but in a good way, like he always felt after a day of physical exercise. A ledger rolling boulevard, he paused at the lights, waiting for them to turn green. A man walked up to him and asked for the time. Theo checked his watch and answered, ten past five, sir. Thank you, young man, said the stranger. That's very kind of you. He fished a coin out of his purse and handed it to Theo, saying, here, take this. You can buy yourself some sweets. No, thanks, sir. You give the time. You don't sell it, said Theo. I insist, said the man. I'll be offended if you don't. For the sake of peace and quiet, Theo took the coin. It was only then that he noticed the man was wearing gloves. Leather gloves in May, 
on a warm day. He put the money inside his pocket and studied the man more closely, but found nothing odd about him except the gloves. The man was well dressed, his hair perfectly groomed and slightly perfumed. His voice maybe was a bit strange, a metallic voice, low and rumbling. Theo couldn't resist asking, excuse me, but I'm curious about your gloves. Why are you wearing them on such a beautiful day? The man smiled. I suffer from Renaud's. It's a condition. It means I have cold hands all year round. Oh, sorry, muttered Theo. If I'd known you were ill. Don't be sorry. They say curiosity killed the cat. But I, on the contrary, believe curiosity is a good quality. To be curious is to seek knowledge. Isn't that so, young man? His last sentence hung in the air as if he were alluding to something else. Theo suddenly felt ill at ease. I need to speak to you, added the man, grabbing Theo's arms. We have important things to discuss. With me? But, but you don't know me, said Theo. I know you better than you think. I've been following you for two days. I left a note for you in the grimoire, but you didn't listen, did you? At those words, Theo's face lost colour and he felt weak at the knees. He stumbled backwards on his rollerblades, mumbling, you, you are... The man, obviously amused at seeing Theo so upset, took off his leather gloves to reveal his long black nails. I am Agnor Ancadeus. Yes, I didn't want to intervene in purpose, but you have forced my hand. You managed to find the egg, the hen's blood. And I saw you collect the pigeon droppings in St. Clohyde. I cannot allow you to finish the spell. How, how did you find me? You, you couldn't follow me around town. I had my rollerblades. The man laughed. Ha 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 ha. Showing small teeth yellowed by tobacco. Let's just say I have my own rollerblades. A special kind of blade, of course. He tried to catch Theo's arm again, but Theo quickly skated backwards up to the edge of the curb. Don't try to outwit me, young man. Give me what you have inside your bag and forget what you read. It's dangerous to play with the high arts. You won't be able to cope. If you touch me again, said Theo, I'll shout. And I'd like to point out there's a policeman just up the street. I noticed, thank you. But one policeman isn't a, biz, biz, isn't a big concern to me. Now give me your bag without a fuss. Don't tell me I've got to force you. With those words, the man took another step towards Theo, then dashed forward trying to seize the rucksack. Theo dodged the attack, throwing himself to the side. The man tripped over Theo's leg and ran into the pelican crossing, bashing his head, his head. He hunched forward, holding his head with both hands, wincing. Theo skated backwards around him, swinging his hips to gain speed. When he was fast enough, he spun so he was forward facing again. In a few swift strides, he disappeared at the corner of Tanua Street. A kindly soul tried to help Mr. Angaeus, but he pushed them aside and got up on his own. Furious, he dusted down his tr dirty trousers, slipped his gloves back on and stumbled away, his head full of ringing bells, all the way up Ledru Rolin. Goaded by fear, Theo skated back home as fast as his legs could carry him. He knocked over a dustbin down Favre Street, had to swerve to avoid two lawyers coming out of court, made an emergency leap over a tiny dog just before the Den Francois alleyway. When they, spotted, when they spotted him, passers-by crossed over or jumped to the nearest house's front step. An old man even tried to hit him with his cane as he whizzed by, but luckily he missed. Marie was outside hanging the laundry when she saw a blonde lightning bolt flash behind the privet shrubs. The bolt took the bend, only barely avoiding the fire hydrant. A moment later, she heard a loud crash coming from the front of the house. She dropped her clean sheets and rushed down the gravelled pathway. Theo, she shouted, are you all right? 
she found her son sitting between the upturned flower pots on the front step. Are you hurt? She asked, dropping to her knees next to him. Show me your hands. Open your mouth. Let me check your teeth. Did you bump your head against anything? No, Mum, muttered Theo, ashamed and bewildered. I'm fine. I broke my fall with my hands. I don't know how I managed to miss that bend. You came blazing past it like a bat out of hell, without your helmet too. How many times must I tell you that you need to wear a helmet when you go skating? I put it on when it's cold, but when it's hot, I sweat and the chin strap shapes my neck. So what, she said, who cares? Don't you understand that if you'd fallen headfirst onto those steps, your head would be cracked like an egg? The comparison struck Theo because he suddenly remembered the rotten egg in his backpack. And what if it was broken? It would be a disaster, everything ruined. He lowered his eyes, dejected. Come on, said his mother, who thought he was upset by her scolding. Let's not mention it any more. Help me get these flower pots back up. You did a strike like you were bowling. They're all down. Once they'd finished rearranging the pots, Theo went upstairs to his room. He took the three boxes out of his bag and quickly opened the one with the rotten egg. Thank goodness the pressured egg was intact. The kitchen roll wrapped around it had protected it from the impact. He checked the other two boxes, the one with the blood and the one with the droppings, then put everything away in one of his desk drawers, the only one that could be locked. He went downstairs to pick up the landline and carried the phone up to his bed. Hello, Bon Ave, it's me, Theo. Something crazy just happened. I was attacked in the street. By who? Levine? No, but Archandaeus, the guy we got the spell from. The guy with the black mouths, said Bonav. That's him. He's nasty. He came up to me casually, asked for the time. Then suddenly he grabbed me and tried to pull my bag off me. Just talking about him gives me the heebie-jeebies. My God, that's incredible, said Bonav. How did he find you? I don't know, said Theo, but apparently he's been following us the whole afternoon. Blimey, that's bad, said Bonnet. And to think we didn't even notice. He didn't follow you back to your house, at least. I don't think so, anyway, said Theo. I lost him by blading down Tanya Street. You should have seen it. Listen, I've got to run. I've got stuff to do. I've got to go through the whole spell again to be sure I don't mess it up by tomorrow night. Oh, and I've got a problem with the hundreds of hours. I can't convert them into minutes. Oh, Theo, said Bonnet, that's easy peasy. Give them to me now. I'll get the conversions done for tomorrow. Theo fished the spell out of the drawer and read it out loud, enunciating each syllable. I've taken notes of all of that, said Bonaventure, once Theo had finished. You'll have it tomorrow. Thanks, Bonav. Try to look for the ring if you can. I've already got the ring, said Bonav. A lovely gold ring with a pearl. I was about to dismantle it when you called. Brilliant. Well, cool. Then I'll see you tomorrow, nine o'clock. Have a nice evening. As soon as he hung up, Marie called up from the kitchen. Are you ready, Theo? You haven't forgotten we're eating with Catherine this evening. That was the final blow. He'd been mugged in the street. He'd taken a fall on his rollerblades. And now he had to go and be bored rigid in the Montmayel's house. He didn't even feel up to an hour of peeling crayfish and getting pink sauce everywhere. And he would have to endure Catherine embarrassing him about his good grades at school. Worse still, he would have to sit next to Nina a flirty, a flirty 14-year-old who liked to tease him by batting her eyelashes and pouting in front of him. What could he do? Pretend he had a headache or a sudden strain in the shoulder to avoid having to go? No, Marie might be worried and she'd take him to the doctor to check nothing was broken. And she was so excited about going out to eat with her friend that he could, that he could be sociable, at least for her. He'd been lying to her a lot these last few days. This small sacrifice would ease his guilty conscience. He decided he would go, but give Nina the cold shoulder, and if need be, he would pull a face if she tried to play her little eyelash game with him. It turned out to be the right decision, because not only was Nina at a friend's party, but he also got to eat chips of food without shells. He was given nuggets and honey ice cream for dessert, which moved him to forgive Catherine Montmagnol for all past unpleasantness. He spent the rest of the evening reading Nina's graphic novels. Her drawers were bulging with comics. He read, he reread Asterix and Corsica, and then a few old Tintins. Then, as he was growing bored, he snooped around the room a bit. 
The place was awful, with pink carpet and matching wallpaper. Dolls and soft toys were thrown down haphazardly into a wicker chair. By chance, as he lifted a pile of old comics, he found a small white book with a golden padlock. He studied it closely and was thrilled to realise it was Nina's diary. Confessions of a flirty teen. That should be interesting. He forced the padlock open with a hairpin and read the diary, chuckling, chuckling softly. The diary was as bonkers as she was. Each page was about brown-haired, blue-eyed boys or blonde-haired, green-eyed boys and hearts beating harder and breaths taken away. It wasn't quite Stendhal or Chalterbrog. They're very good French writers, that was for sure. But then Theo was stunned to find a passage about a handsome young man with dark eyes and bronze skin who has wonderful light auburn hair called Theo. His cheeks bright red, he closed the diary and put it back where he had found it. I'll be back to read chapter eight next week.